Welcome back to the Buddhist Audio Bookshelf YouTube channel. Today, we continue our reading of Meditation by Thanissaro Bhikkhu, also known as Jeffrey Degriff. We deeply value your support, please like and share this audiobook to reach a wider audience, allowing more people to benefit from its wisdom. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, ensuring you receive immediate notifications as we upload new content. Together, we can spread the teachings of meditation and mindfulness, fostering a community of enlightenment and inner peace. Thank you for being part of our journey to make these profound teachings accessible to all. Let's start today with reading. The Meaning of the Body. October 15, 2004. Everything in life is fabricated. It's all put together. And it doesn't just fall together on its own. A lot of eerd goes into putting things together. And because we have to put so much eerd into life, we want to make sure that our eerd is well directed, our energy is well spent. Otherwise you can waste whole lifetimes of a lot of eerd, a lot of hard, hard work, and have nothing really to show for it. As the Buddha pointed out, the best use of our eerds is to nd those spots where the whole fabricated system opens out to something unfabricated. Everything else that's fabricated he said to look at is means. Even our intermediate goals along the path are means to a further end, so we have to learn to look at them just as that, as means. Even our relations with other people should be regarded as means to this higher end. Now, this would sound sell sh and calculating if it weren't for the fact that our goal is one that gives no harm to anyone at all. Look at those reactions on the four requisites. Just the fact that you're born with a body means that you're a big consumer of food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. So one of the kindest things you can do for anyone is to get yourself out of the system. Think of all the sewering that goes into keeping you fed and clothed and sheltered, and making sure your health stays good all the work from the plants on up. The people who have to grow the plants, the people who have to buy the plants, transport the plants that so you have food to eat. Someone once traced a sweatshirt from his Becky Cotton, through Iranian mills and South Korean factories, and Nelly showing up in a Gap warehouse in Kentucky. And that's just clothing. It goes all over the world a couple of times before it gets to you, just to meet your need for protection against the elements. The fact that you have this body means that you're constantly consuming, and that a lot of work goes into meeting the body's needs. So the issue is how to get the best use out of the body, because someday you're going to have to throw it away. If you don't let go of it nicely, it's going to push you out, and before you go you'll probably have to put up with disease and all the other problems that come as you begin to lose your grip. This part of the body stops functioning, that part stops functioning, you growing continent so you want to learn how to look at the body not as an end in and of itself, but as a means, as a tool in the practice leading to a happiness beyond the body. If you expect too much happiness simply from having a body, you're making unrealistic demands on it. It's the same with relationships. If you're expecting a relationship to provide you with all the happiness you want in the world, it's going to be a die-cult relationship. Often, subconsciously, that's the kind of relationship we have with our own bodies. So learn how to look at the body in its true nature, so that you're not surprised when it grows ill, and does funny things as it grows ill. Once, when I was in Thailand, I was one of a group of monks visiting a man in the hospital. He had developed liver cancer and didn't know how much longer he was going to live, so he wanted to make some merit. That's why we went. Unusually for his generation in Thailand, he'd been a Tness freak, and had been very proud all the way up through his thighs that he'd stayed slim and trim, while all of his friends had gotten paunchy. We talked about how he should meditate, but he kept complaining about how ashamed he was that his stomach had bloated up from the liver cancer, and that he was no longer in good shape. He couldn't focus his mind on the breath all because he had developed unrealistic expectations about the body's potential for health. But if you learn to expect that the body's going to grow disease no matter how well you care for it, disease is not such a shock or a problem when it actually comes. This is one of the reasons for that contemplation on the 32 parts of the body to realize there's the potential for all kinds of steward to happen in the body, to realize that that's the body's nature. 
As long as you latch onto it as yours and develop pride around it, if you look at its health as a goal in and of itself, whether through exercise or natural foods or whatever else you're setting yourself up for a problem. But if you see it simply as a means to a higher end, you're in a lot better shape. So when you end the mind growing concerned about the body and many times it's amazing, as your life gets more and more simply ed as a meditator, how you can get more and more obsessed with the body, making sure that it's healthy, making sure it's getting the right food and medicines. You have to develop a sense of proportion around those issues so that you can focus on using the body for other things. After all, it's one of the foundations of mindfulness, one of the frames of reference. You have to learn how to be on friendly terms with it. It's funny. We contemplate, filled with all sorts of unclean things and at the same time, be friends with the body. But that's an important part of being friends with people. Being very clear about their shortcomings so you don't demand too much out of them and at the same time gaining a clear sense of where their strengths actually lie. And the body does have a lot of strengths. It's a good place to stay. As long as you're alive you can take it as a frame of reference. As the Buddha said, it's one of the ways of creating an island for yourself. As he was about to die, he told his monks, you can't depend on the Buddha. You can't depend on the person of the Tathagata, because like every other person his body is going to have to go. So he reminded all of his followers to make themselves an island. He said, how do you do that? Take the body in and of itself as your frame of reference, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with regard to the world. That's one of the four ways of creating your island. In other words, you take the body just as it is, as you're immediately experiencing it. And one way of doing that is to stay with the breath coming in, going out, being with the sensation of the breath. Or you can analyze the 32 parts of the body. Or the elements of the body. The warmth, which is the re-element, the motion in the body, which is the wind element, the cool and liquid sensations, the water element, and the solid and heavy ones, the earth element. Try to bring them into a balance, as a way of keeping yourself anchored in the present moment. One of the reasons we do this is because there are not that many narratives around these things. The breath has one narrative. It's in and it's out, it's comfortable and it's not. That's it. Not much of a narrative. And it's a great dissolver for the narratives the mind spins for itself. Once the mind spins its narratives, it snares itself, like a spider caught in its own web. Someone once said that the universe isn't made out of atoms, it's made out of stories. That may not be true of the physical universe, but the universe of our lives is certainly made out of stories, and often they're oppressive stories, stories that create a lot of sewering for ourselves and for the people around us. And yet we allow ourselves to get caught up in them. A good way to cut through those narratives is just to stay with the sensation of the body in and of itself here in the present moment. This helps get you out of the narratives so that you can realize how unreal they are. At the same time, you see all the earth that goes into those narratives. And. What do you get out of them? A lot of times it's zooring. Some narratives are useful, but the important point of this practice is that you put yourself in a position where you can choose which narratives you're going to get involved with, and which ones you're not. Otherwise you're subject to everything the mind spins out. So whatever way you have of making yourself comfortable with the sensation of the body in the present working with the breath, working with other parts of the body, working with the elements regard that as your island, as your safe haven outside of the narratives. That way the mind has a foundation. Once it has a foundation, it's not knocked over by things. Events in the world can go past you, they can go through you, as long as you're not latching onto things. The sense of the body can provide a larger context for all your experiences of the world. Once you have this sense of being here in your foundation, then the experiences of the world are just sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations, all contained within this context of the body. This is not to deny that they have reality, but look, for instance, at your experience of color. How do you know that the sky is actually blue out there the way you see it? What's blue about the frequency of the light waves scattered by the molecules in the air? 
the blue is all in your brain's reactions to the impulses sent in by the eyes, that's all. It's something experienced in the context of the body. All the objects of the senses are experienced here in the context of the body. When you realize that, it helps make this context a lot stronger, the foundation gets more deeply set. It's more all-encompassing, less likely to get knocked over by things. So the body is good grounding for concentration practice. It's also a good object for insight practice, developing insight into the whole issue of which actions are skillful, which ones are not, which mental qualities lead to sewering, which mental qualities lead to the end of sewering, which assumptions pile on sewering, which assumptions are part of the path. The word sana has as one of its meanings assumptions the way you label things. For example, there's the way you label pain. Some of the ways you label it cause it to build up, make it more and more of an issue. Or you can label it in other ways that cut through the issues. One way of dealing with pain once the mind settles down and can actually look at pain and not feel threatened by it, is to ferret out when you have a feeling of pain exactly which sensations are the pain sensations and which sensations are the body sensations again, the four elements. Solidity, warmth, coolness, movement. We tend to glom the whole thing together, but when you start taking it apart and seeing it as species C, separate sensations, you begin to see how eating pain is, just like pleasure. The actual sensations of the body are more lasting, and the pain sensations come and go come and go, come and go, sometimes in very quick succession. Even in a part of the body that seems to be nothing but a mass of pain, you can start ferreting out the diron sensations to see which sensation precisely is the pain there, and which are other sensations heat, solidity that have somehow gotten glued to the pain by your labeling. If you label them in a diron way, they get unglued. Instead of your hip or your back or your leg being a whole mass of pain, you realize there are just these eating sensations of pain together with other eating sensations. This makes pain a lot less threatening. It also shows you the power of your perceptions, that what you thought was a given was actually something you had glued together yourself. This makes you want to turn around and look at the whole process of labeling things in the mind in other areas as well. So in all these cases you're using the body as an aid in the practice, which is aimed at pursuit of true happiness. If you're looking at the body as a goal in and of itself, it's going to disappoint you big time, but if you learn to use it as a tool, the happiness that results as you use it wisely gets more and more solid, more and more secure. As you get more self-reliant in this way, you lean less on other people. Your ears produce more happiness both for yourself and for the people around you, because you spend less time weighing everyone down with your unnecessary burdens. So developing a balanced attitude toward the body is a very important part of the practice. And to develop that balance we have diron tools. Some tend to emphasize the shortcomings of the body, others, the importance of the body. Instead of saying that you like some tools and don't like other tools, remember that all the tools have their function, they all have their time and their place. The more tools you master, the better oa you are because you have tools for any situation whatever comes up. Pleasure and Pain April 15, 2005 Pleasure and pain are big issues in our lives so big that you'd think we would understand them better. It's because we let ourselves get pushed around by these things without really looking into them. That's why we sewer so much. And one of the reasons we don't look into them is because it's hard. Pain especially is hard to look at. We've been dealing with pleasure and pain ever since we were born, and a lot of our habits for dealing with pleasure and pain are things we learned before we could even talk, before we could understand anything at all. So there's a lot of ignorance here that we haven't explored. Meditating is basically making up our minds to try and understand these two issues which are basically one issue. The issue of feeling. We start out by establishing a beachhead for ourselves. In the midst of all the chaos of the world, we have our little corner here. That's what Ajahn Zhu would like to call the monastery here. Our quiet corner. You have to make a quiet corner in the mind as well. If you wait for the world to settle down and be a good place to live in, where everybody's fair and just, 
You'll never have your chance to straighten out your own mind. You'll die RST. This is why you have to start here, creating this little corner and giving all your attention to this one spot where you're focusing on the breath or whatever your meditation object is. The purpose is to create a little space, at least, where you can put aside the madness of the world where you feel solid, secure, where there's a sense of well-being. So you end a spot that's relatively comfortable and you work to make it more comfortable. You learn how to recognize when the breath is too long or too short because it doesn't feel right. Nobody out there can tell you that this kind of breathing is too long or that this kind of breathing is too short, too shallow, too deep, or whatever. You've got to notice these things on your own. Learn how to be sensitive just to this process of breathing and go out for yourself. What is the sign of a breath that's too long or too short? You've got to develop your own sensitivities. This is what insight is all about. Developing your inner sensitivity to pleasure and pain so that you can detect them on their subtlest levels. If you wait until they're really strong, you get overwhelmed. So start on this subtle level here. Just the breathing. Then when you've got a spot here that feels good the breath comes in, it feels good, the breath goes out, it feels good. You can let the sense of boundary around your little spot dissolve away. Think of the sense of ease spreading out from that spot, owing along whatever channels there are in the body that pleasure can now, permeating in all directions. Again, this is up to you to decide what works in your sense of the body. Teachers can give pointers, but you've got to take the pointers and put them into practice and see what works and what doesn't work for you. It's a matter of developing the right sensitivity. You can't take someone else's insights and just slap them onto your experience and claim to have wisdom. Discernment comes in three forms. The discernment you learn from other people the things you hear, the things you read that's one level, the things you think through that's another level, and nally the things you learn by trying to develop mindfulness, alertness, and other good qualities of the mind. The third level is where the insight really becomes your own, it's your own sensitivity showing you these things. Once you've developed your beachhead, your quiet corner, work out from there. See how it relates to other things going on in the body, particularly other feelings of pleasure, other feelings of pain. Some kinds of pain you can work through. As you expand the sense of the comfortable breath, it begins to dissolve the pain away. Or if there's a sense of tension around the pain, you can dissolve the tension away. Even though the pain may stay there, dissolving the tension around it can help a lot. It makes it a lot easier to live with these things. So get as much of the body as comfortable as you can. That's when you can really look into the pain still remaining, because you've got your foundation, and you've been developing sensitivity. You can begin to see which part of the pain is physical, and which is mental in other words, which part of the pain comes from actions of the mind, the way the mind reacts to the raw data of physical pain, the way it puts a label on it, the way it constructs dialogues around it. All the wild beasts in your savanna here are going to come gathering around the waterhole of the pain. That little child who is always feeling wronged, the little child who feels whatever. You end that when you get in touch with your inner child it whines a lot. And especially here, right at the pain. If you can learn not to identify with it, you learn a lot of interesting things. You sense how when this particular thought comes and surrounds the pain, it makes the pain worse. This particular thought makes it better. You see these things through your own sensitivity, by having a place to stand and watch where you're not totally threatened by the pain. At the same time, you learn how to deal with pleasure. It's so easy, when there's a sense of pleasure in the body, just to drop the breath and forget about your meditation, and to indulge in the pleasure. That's something you also have to work to overcome. It's not that you want to destroy the pleasure, it's just that you learn how to be with it, how to use it, and not get sucked in by it. In other words, you learn how to change your relationship both to pleasure and to pain. If you approach pleasure the right way, you can use it as a foundation for stronger and stronger powers of concentration and more and more stillness. The greater the stillness, the more sensitivity you can bring to discerning pleasure and the pain. So in both cases you're trying to learn how to deal with pleasure and pain and not be overwhelmed by them, 
to watch how your mind reacts in unskillful ways to them so you can begin to unlearn a lot of the bad habits you developed way back when. As you learn how to approach both pleasure and pain in more skillful ways as tools on the path, rather than ends in themselves, you end that your new understanding has an impact on the entirety of your life, because so much of your life is driven by pleasure and pain. When you can see them both more clearly and your reactions to them more clearly you're not driven. You have a wider range of choice. More freedom. And it all starts right here, at the basic building blocks. The physical world may be made out of atoms, but the world of your experience is made out of little things like this pleasures and pains. So use the techniques of the meditation to become more skillful in how you deal with the basic building blocks. Once the basic building blocks are well in hand, then the whole rest of your life gets rebuilt. Invest in your happiness. August 3, 2004. One of the purposes of meditation is to sensitize yourself to the fact that you're not simply a passive observer of what's going on. Life isn't a television show that you simply sit and watch. It's an interactive video game. You're actively creating the characters, designing the plot, in addition to watching it. The Buddha's teachings on Sankara, fabrication, point to this fact. He denies fabrication as intentional acts. There is an element of intention in all your experience. Everything you sense, whether in the physical world or the mental world, has an element of intention. That's what makes it an experience. Without that intention you wouldn't experience anything. Because our intentions aim at happiness, what we're living with right now is the result of our attempts at happiness, pleasure, well-being. That's a sobering thought. You look at what you're experiencing and some of it's happy and some of it's not. And to think that this is the result of every act you've done to achieve happiness. It gives you pause. When you think in this way, you begin to see the areas where you've fallen short. But at the same time you can focus on the areas where you've had some success. After all, if you hadn't had some success, you wouldn't be here meditating. You wouldn't be a human being. You'd be prowling around as a common animal, a hungry ghost, a prisoner of hell. So when you practice concentration, the Buddha has you focus on the sense of well-being you've already got here. What you need to do is to learn how to maximize that well-being, because one of the reasons we're so careless in the way we approach happiness is that we get serious about it only when there's a lot of pain. We focus on the pain. We've got to exit. And there's a sense of desperation about trying to X our pain, X our zurings. Yet when things get easy, we get lazy. Complacent. All we want to do is just wallow in that sense of well-being. And of course wallowing in it is not a cause for more happiness. It just eats up what we already have. So the trick is to learn how to develop a sense of well-being, and then not to be heedless to see what further good we can get out of that well-being. Ajahn Lee gives an example. He says it's like having a tree that gives coconuts. If you want, you can eat up all the coconuts, but that's all you get. A stomach full of coconuts, and soon you're hungry again. But if you take some of the coconuts and plant them, you get more trees and then more. Trees because you're willing to take what you've got and invest some of it. In the same way, when you meditate, you take what sense of well-being you have and invest some of it in creating more well-being. So you start by focusing on where the breath feels good coming in, feels good going out. If you can't get a good sense of ease with the breath, start with thoughts of goodwill. Wish goodwill for yourself, goodwill for other beings. That's a comfortable thought because it's not ting with the wishes of any being anywhere. Everybody wants to be happy. So you wish them happiness. And then from that sense of harmonious well-being, you focus on the breath. There should be at least some spot in the body where the breath feels good. Look for it, and then keep watch over it in such a way that you don't spoil it. Sometimes when you focus on the body you tense up around the part where you're focusing. That makes it tight, uncomfortable. Part of this comes from envisioning the body as something very solid. Remember that. What you're experiencing here is an energy eld, the energy owing through the body. 
some parts of the energy held may seem to feel more solid than others, but if you think about the whole thing as the owing of an energy held, then if there are areas where it seems blocked or squeezed, you can think of opening up a new channel so that the energy easily owes in, owes out. Without your having to pull it or push it or exert any pressure on it at all. It comes in, comes out on its own. All you have to do is keep tabs on it. Allow it to be comfortable. Think of it that way. Instead of making it comfortable, you're going to allow it to be comfortable. And then allow it to stay that way. Don't interfere with it. Don't mess with it. In other words, as long as you're going to be shaping the present moment, try to be sensitive to how you're doing it. If things are going well, don't mess them up. Be alert to what you're doing, because every action, as the Buddha said, aims at happiness. Be alert to that. What you're experiencing has an element of your intention for happiness built into it. Be sensitive to that, and also to whether it's working or not. If it's not working, you can change. Change the way you breathe, change the way you focus, change the way you conceive of your experience of the present, the experience of the body sitting here right now. Allow for some more possibilities. This is what a lot of the meditation opens up. Seeing the possibilities of what can be done with the present moment. For example, a thought comes into the mind. Our tendency is then to just jump with the thought and go into the thought world and ride with it wherever it goes. Or in other words, we get taken wherever it's going to take us. But if you're really observant, you begin to notice that it's possible for a thought to arise without your going with it. It doesn't have to pull you away from the breath. After all, the breath is still here, going in, going out. If thoughts destroyed our breathing, we would have died a long time ago. Thoughts come in, thoughts go out, and the breath is still there. And there's a part of your awareness in touch with that. We tend to block that awareness out so we can get into the thought, but the trick here is to allow it to stay open, so that when a thought comes it doesn't pull you away the way it used to. That possibility you may not have noticed before. And as you meditate you end the other possibilities as well. We're experimenting with the potential for ending happiness, so always keep that experimental attitude in mind. What is experiment except for the belief that maybe not everything is already known? Maybe some of the knowledge that has been passed on from other people, or that we've cooked up ourselves, isn't right. Someone once denied science as the belief that the experts can be wrong. Meditation serves the same function, allowing you to question the things you thought you knew for sure. They may be wrong. Check that out. You've got the breath and the mind here in the present moment as your laboratory, so work on these things to create a more stable, more satisfying sense of pleasure right here and now. Even though this pleasure is fabricated, it's part of the path. It's the pleasure part of the path. People often complain about how the Four Noble Truths focus on sewering, but if you look at them carefully you see that the most important of them is the fourth truth, the path to the end of sewering. It's the RST one the Buddha taught. It's the one truth that contains all four noble truths right there in right view. At its heart, though, is right concentration. If you look at the definition of right concentration, that's where you end the pleasure. The RST jhana starts out with a sense of rapture and ease, or rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. In other words, you pull the mind away from its outside objects, outside distractions, and just stay right here. Then as you create a greater sense of pleasure, a greater sense of ease in the present moment, that's the heart of the path. It's something you develop. So we're here trying to maximize the pleasure we've got, not simply to bliss out, although it's nice to be able to bliss out, but also to be alert, to be mindful, to still have a sense of heedfulness. What's the use of this bliss? That's the next step. When you have this sense of pleasure born from seclusion, you can see things more clearly if you handle the pleasure right, if your attitude toward the pleasure is right. When the mind has a sense of ease and well-being, you can look at your attachments, you can look at all of the other mistakes you've been making, with a much greater sense of fairness, a much greater sense of objectivity, with less sense of being desperate. 
It's like the diaries between people who have to worry about where tomorrow's meal coming from, as opposed to those who don't have to worry about that at all. When you don't have to worry about your next meal, you have a lot more time to think about things, to look at things, to ponder them objectively. So when we meditate, we're developing a skill that gives us a sense of ease right now that we can begin to trust, that we can tap into again and again and again. We don't have to worry about where our next hit of happiness is going to come from. That changes the way the mind approaches its experiences, its pleasures and pains. It becomes a lot less desperate. Of course there's always the danger of complacency when you grew you can. Tap into the breath at any time, but if you can overcome that complacency, you begin to realize that this is an extremely useful state of mind, a very skillful way of approaching happiness, and a very skillful way of providing a foundation for yourself so that you can end greater happiness. As the Buddha said, the noble path is fabricated. It's the highest fabrication of all. So when we know it's fabricated, we should do it. Mindfully, with a sense of alertness to what we're doing and to the results we're getting. This is what makes it a skill. And we see the results not only in the immediate present, but also over time. As I said earlier, what we're living with is the results of our attempts at happiness. And as we practice, we end that the results get better and better because we're clearer and clearer about what we're doing. All of the Buddha's teachings are meant to help us in this quest for a true happiness, the ultimate happiness, Nibbana. That's where they're all aimed. It's a happiness that isn't fabricated, but the only way you can get there, the only way you can get beyond fabrication, is to learn how to fabricate well. Things as they've come to be. August 29, 2005. Sometimes at the end of suttas, when the Buddha has been teaching the monks, he concludes by telling them to go meditate. Actually, what he says is to go do jhana, because that's the kind of meditation he taught. Some people think that jhana is only one of two types of meditation he taught, that he also taught vipassana, but there's never any passage where he tells anybody to go do vipassana. It's always, go do jhana. This is because he saw jhana as a practice where you develop both tranquility and insight together. In other words, you need to develop tranquility and insight just to get into jhana to begin with, to get into good states of concentration. Then when you've developed that concentration, you can use it to develop qualities of tranquility and insight even further. So try not to see the two qualities as separate. When you're studying the mind, you've got to have some understanding of what you're doing. After all, the RST jhana involves directed thought and evaluation, which are called sankaras verbal sankaras and sankaras are the topics of insight. When you direct your thoughts to the breath and then evaluate the breath, this is how you settle down. The more precisely you evaluate the breath, the more sensitive you are to the breath sensations in the body, then the more you can make them a comfortable place to be. And in the course of doing that, you learn things both about the breath and about the mind. What kind of sensations the mind likes, what kinds it doesn't like, how the mind acts the breath, how the breath acts the mind. Right there is a lot of raw material for insight. But in the beginning your purpose is more to settle the mind. This is the tranquility side of meditation practice, ending the sensations that are easiest to stay with and learning how to maximize those sensations so that you can develop a oneness of mind around them. Oneness here means not only being steadily with one object, but also allowing the object to LL your awareness so that it's the one thing you're aware of. When you focus on breathing, it's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs. It's a sensation of energy that owes through the whole body and you're sitting in the middle of this vast breathing process that acts every nerve, every muscle. The whole experience of your body is related to the breath. The more you can perceive the breath in that way, the easier it is to settle down. And the easier it is to stay settled down, working on what the Buddha calls the enlarged mind Mahagadam Siddham, an awareness that's all around. That kind of awareness is what allows you to see things for what they are. It's the foundation for the vipassana side of jhana practice. In other words, the Buddha doesn't say to stop doing jhana in order to start doing vipassana. 
he just says to learn how to look at the jhana in a different way, as a process of fabrication, how it's put together. We often think that vipassana means seeing things as they are, the idea being that there's something already out there things as they are, and they're all covered over by our preconceived notions, our mental fabrications. What we've got to do is clear those fabrications away, and that will leave just the pristine things as they are. But that's not really how insight works. That understanding actually gets in the way of insights arising because the Buddha didn't say, things as they are. He said, things as they've come to be. How they've come into being. That's a process of fabrication. It's not the case that fabrications lie on top of pristine things as they are. Fabrication is how those things have come into being in the RST place. So once the mind is settled down you want to look at the fabricating that goes on in the mind to see how the things you experience contain a very large element of fabrication. The fabrication is your intentional input. That's what the Buddha wants you to see. You might think that if only you could. Get rid of your fabrication you would see the pristine things as they are, but if you take away the fabrication the things are no longer there. Your experience of the world is a process of fabrication, to gain insight you have to see that fabrication in action. And the best place to see it in action is when the mind is really still, when you're fabricating a state of stillness in the mind. To get really familiar with the fabrication process, you have to keep doing it with as much skill as you can. It's like learning about eggs. You could sit and look at an egg for days, but what would you know about it? Not very much, for all you can see is the shell. But what if you can crack it open? You see what's inside. And then you can take what's inside and make it into dire things. You can make it into scrambled eggs, fried eggs, omelets, suez. And the more skilled you are at making dire egg dishes, the more you understand eggs. How they react to dire kinds of heat, what they do when you put them over low heat, what they do when you put them over high heat what they do when you mix them with dirent ingredients. The more you work with the eggs in this way, the more you understand them. It's the same with the mind. If you really want to understand the fabrication of the mind, make it into a nice ooey. In other words, very purposefully fabricate something really good with your mind, like a nice state of concentration with a nice comfortable breath. And in doing so, you learn a lot more about the mind than you would simply looking at it without any knowledge of cause and eact. You've got to manipulate it to see how cause and eact are operating. That's when you understand the process of fabrication. You get the mind really still and try to develop an all-around awareness. Then you protect that awareness. That's when you start seeing fabrication in action. As you try to maintain your concentration, what destroys it? At RST we think that it's destroyed by things coming in from the outside, but that's not the case. A lot of the inside fabrication comes bubbling up to destroy it as well. Sounds don't destroy your concentration, it's your reaction to sounds. What other people do doesn't destroy your concentration, it's what you do. As Ajahn Chah says, sounds don't disturb you, you disturb the sounds. If you want to really see this clearly, the best place to see it is in the mind with this all-around awareness. Don't leave this awareness. If you leave jhana in order to gain insight, you've lost your foundation, and you just thrash around. And the mind can get very anxious, very alienated, very threatened by the insights you try to push on it, because it realizes it doesn't have a foundation. So stay in your foundation and look to see what's going to arise there. Like a spider on a web. You want to be sensitive to the whole body in the same way that the spider is sensitive to the whole web. The best way to do that is to have all the dire strands connected. That's why we work on connecting all the comfortable sensations in the body so that they form a network, a network of heightened sensitivity inside. Then all you have to do is stay in touch with the network. As soon as anything comes up maybe a little stirring here and there on the boundary line between the body and mind you sense it through the network. As soon as you sense it, you can zap it. A little stirring forms and you can tease it out, unform it, zap it. If you're not quick to zap it, the mind will identify it as a thought about this or that, 
and then you create a whole thought world based on the way you label the stirring. The best way to see the stages in how that happens is to try to stop them as soon as you notice them and dissolve the thought away. You may end that a part of the mind gets frustrated when you zap things in this way. It wants to continue weaving those thoughts, exploring those thought worlds. If you want to understand that compulsion to keep creating these thought worlds, one of the best ways is to thwart it. Keep saying, nope, nope, nope. As soon as there's the slightest little bit of recognition that this is a thought about that, that's a thought about this, dissolve it, no matter what the thought may seem to be, and see which part of the mind starts screaming. That's how you start understanding the will, the intentional element, behind the fabrication. Once you understand it, you can dismantle it bit by bit by bit. This way you get more and more sensitive to the parts of the mind that you use to keep hidden from yourself. As you bring them out into the open, that's where insight can do its work. These things don't come out of their lair unless you stand in the entrance to keep their food from coming in. Or it's like people who live in underground strongholds who like to pull the strings. They won't come out unless they feel frustrated because they can't pull the strings anymore, so you have to step on their strings. This is how you ultimately come to understand the whole process of fabrication. And where do you look for it? Wherever there's stress. Ajahn Zuit used to mention this often. Look at where there's stress, and that's where you see fabrication, where you see fabrication is where you see the ignorance that's been causing you to sewer. As you bring more and more of that ignorance out into the open, there comes a point where it just stops. Because you see even the slightest little things that would cause stress. In seeing these things, you replace the ignorance with knowledge. All of the background commentating that goes on in the mind and is trying to direct everything starts coming more and more to the fore. When you see it clearly, you can allow it to stop. And that's when you come to see something unfabricated, where the stress really ends. You don't have to go out of concentration in order to see it. You take the concentration apart from within. So this is why, when you're trying to gain insight and you're feeling strung out and anxious, it's a sign you've lost your foundation. You're looking in the wrong place. Get the mind into a good state of concentration, have it all around aware, and then start looking at the process of fabrication as it appears from this viewpoint. You don't have to go anywhere else. Someone once asked me how I dealt with people who found the experience of awakening to be disorienting. That's about as wrong-headed a question as you can get. Awakening is very orienting the most orienting thing in life. It shows you that there's something a lot more solid and reliable than you'd ever imagined before. It shows you something deathless and totally free from sewering. And where do you look for it? You look right here. Right where the mind is settled and still. Then you learn to see that settled stillness is a process of fabrication, and you start taking it apart right where it's happening. You don't have to go anywhere else. Fabricating the present. August 20, 2004. Bring the mind to the breath, for this is where everything important is happening. You want to be as still as possible so that you can catch sight of all these important things happening, because most often we don't see that there's anything important here. The breath goes in, goes out. That's all we see, we've got other business to do, so we let it go on automatic pilot. As a result, we miss a lot of the things that are going on. But when we meditate, we stop to take time to look at this process. Ajahn Lee once made the comment that when you have the mind with the breath you've got all four of the foundations of mindfulness right here. All four of the potential frames of reference that you can use in your practice. There's body, feelings, mind states, and the mental qualities that are either helping or hindering you in seeing what's going on. It's all here. If you want to see the relationships among these things, you watch right here. You don't watch anywhere else. What are you watching for? Well, you want to see the how the mind shapes things. Ajahn Suet once made the comment that if you're looking for ignorance, you don't have to look very far. Just look at the fabrications of the mind. The principle of dependent co-arising says that fabrications are conditioned by ignorance. So if you're wondering where this ignorance is that we're trying to track down, 
It's right here where the mind is fashioning things fashioning bodily sensations and mental events. From fabrication comes consciousness, and consciousness leads to name and form. Physical and mental phenomena. It's worth thinking about. Fabrication, this process of making, comes before phenomena themselves. We hear so often how people shape their reality, how our perceptions tend to alter the ways we see reality, and yet we don't see it as it's actually happening, even though it happens very directly right here. Even in your own sense of the body there are lots of dire sensations coming in, through the various nerve ends. The mind has its habits for selecting among these sensations to present itself with a picture of what's going on. Sometimes the physical sensations get mixed up with the mental sensations, for lots of mental information is coming in at the same time. And so we select things, block some things out, highlight others, to create the story of our mind, our sense of what's going on in here. And there's ignorance underlying it all. What we're trying to do here is to replace that ignorance with clear knowing. This is why we bring the mind to the present moment. So we can watch this process as it happens. Bring it right to that frontier where the body and the mind meet, where mental and physical phenomena meet. The mind watching the breath. It's right here that you can see the process of fabrication really clearly, if you look. But RST, you've got to create the conditions for it to be clear. This is why we practice concentration. We've got to get the mind still and engaged in mastering a skill. The skill of being still. That's when it's easiest to see the mind, when the mind is clearest. When it's aware of what it's doing and of what the results are. Even if it's not doing anything at all, you want to be aware of the fact that it's not doing anything and aware of the results of not doing anything. People often talk about how, when they're practicing a skill, if they get really good at it, there come times when they get into what they call the zone, where everything seems automatic, and even the slightest things become apparent where they're one with the baseball, or one with the bat, or one with the basketball. In the same way, when you meditate you want to get one with the breath. Try to get you into the breath. Try to get on good terms, be comfortable, be familiar with the breath, so that there comes. A point where it seems like your awareness and the breath become one. Only when we allow them to be one and to stay that way will they actually begin to separate out naturally through the process of fabrication. You can see it clearly as it happens. This is why we work so much with the breath. 1. The mind working with the breath puts itself in a good position to observe itself. 2. By working with the breath, things get calmed down. It's a lot easier to see events in the mind when the breath is very still than when the breath is moving all over the place. That's why step number four in breath meditation, after you're aware of the whole body, is to allow what they call bodily fabrication to calm down. Bodily fabrication means the in and out breath. You allow the breath to calm down. Try to be sensitive to whatever mechanical ways you have of breathing or to any unthought out ideas of what the breath should be. Often those ideas will keep you pumping and pumping and pumping, even when the body's full of breath energy and doesn't need much more. It can get by with very little in and out breathing. Ajahn Fueng's analogy is of a big water jar you see these all over Thailand, enormous jars for catching rainwater running all house roofs. As he says, there comes a point when the jar is full, and no matter how much more it rains you can't put any more water in the jar. The same with the breath energy in the body. There comes a point where it's full. You're sitting here and the breath energy seems perfectly capable of just being there, without pumping much in, pumping much out just an energy exchange around the edges. Try to be aware of that. The sensation of energy at your skin. If you feel any tightness in your skin anywhere, think of it's opening up all around you. That allows all those little muscles in the pores to open up a bit, and that in turn allows the breath energy to come in. As the mind settles down and is still in the midst of all this, you need less and less and less oxygen. It's not that you're stying the breath or forcing it to stop. You're just getting more and more sensitive to how heavy or long the breathing has to be. After a while you end that it naturally gets lighter and shorter, if you're paying attention. There may be longer and longer gaps between an in-breath and an out-breath, 
that's perfectly nan till everything gets still. There may be a little bit of breathing in and out right at the surface. Ajin Lee's analogy is of the vapor coming o of an ice cube. But otherwise what? You've got here seems to be a big energy eld. And it's hard to say whether it's a physical energy eld or a mental energy eld. It's just an energy eld. Energetic, but still. Learn to stay there for a good long while, because this is where the interesting things happen. This is also where you get the energy you need. When you've got the energy owing around, everything is connected. This gives you strength, gives your meditation strength. It gives you the range in which you can watch the process of fabrication. Little things seem to stir here, stir there. Sometimes they don't amount to anything. Sometimes they catch hold and turn into thoughts. Or else they turn into major physical sensations. It depends on which way you interpret them, how you read them. Just this in itself allows you to see how much the mind shapes things. But for the time being you don't want to follow these things. You want to get good at zapping them. In other words, where there's a slight complication in the energy eld, just comb it out. Open it up so that it doesn't tighten up into something. Get good at that again and again and again. Like those cartoon frogs with very long tongues. They sit there and a Y comes by, and no matter which direction the Y comes from, zap, they get the Y, and then the tongue goes back into the mouth. In other words, your center is right here, wherever you have a sense of being centered in the body. And then your awareness goes out to zap any of those little fabrications as they come. Then you return to your center. Why do you do this? So that you can get clearer and clearer about how the process of fabrication begins. Where are those points when the mind begins to label things? Ah, this is a thought of the future, this is a thought of the past. This is your arm. This is your leg. This is warmth. This is coolness. This is energy. This is solidity. The mind can choose these things, choose what to focus on, how to label it. And once it chooses to give a particular interpretation, it will end all sorts of evidence elsewhere in that range of your awareness to support it, to provide the context for whatever that perception was. If you get hoodwinked into those little worlds, you can't see what they're doing because all of a sudden you've got a dire in context. So instead, you want to maintain this context of a broad awareness, at the borderline between what's physical and mental. As you get more and more used to being here, you start seeing a lot of interesting things about the processes of the mind. Those are the processes we want to understand. The fabrication, the sankaras the Buddha talks about. Unless you see very clearly how they happen, there's no way you're going to end what's unfabricated, because you keep falling into their little worlds, the little contexts they create for you. And you miss the processing itself. It's like the difference between getting involved in the story of a TV show and watching it to see how the director manipulates things. So much of our lives is spent in these stories. It's a good idea to step back and ask who's directing this. And how are they directing it? And what skill do they have? How do they draw you in? What's the hook? To make another analogy, it's like learning how to write magazine articles. The editors will tell you that the RST sentence, the RST paragraph, needs a hook, something to draw the reader in. Otherwise the reader won't get into your context. This is how the mind works. It hooks you into a little world and takes you wherever it wants you to go. And the raw materials are pretty meager just this energy that begins to collect here and to clot there and turn into something. Like those little seed crystals they use to make rain. The water vapor gathers around the seed crystals and turns into raindrops. As the raindrops add up they become a rainstorm. Without the seed crystals the vapor wouldn't coalesce. These Little seed crystals of fabrication form in the mind, then thoughts and other things form around them, and all of a sudden you've got a thought storm. You don't see this until you learn how to hang around this place where you're just with the eld of energy. Awareness energy, breath energy. It has the potential to turn into any kind of energy depending on how you interpret it. If you hang out here, you start seeing lots of interesting things, learn a lot about the mind, which is why we use the breath to bring us here. And 
Why we continue using the breath to help us maintain this stance. When Ajahn Vueng students would get to this point in their meditation, he'd have them play with the elements. Re, water, earth, space, and consciousness. You begin to see that the way you sense your body depends on exactly what you focus on. The potential for all six elements is all here, throughout this range of energy. It depends on which sensations you're going to focus on, which ones you emphasize. Seeing this serves. Three purposes. 1. It gets you really focused on the present moment. 2. It helps make you more comfortable being here. And 3. You see the process of fabrication at work. You see how you've got raw materials here in the present moment, and how the element of fabrication shapes them into experiences. As a meditator you want to see this clearly again, and again. And again, so that ultimately you can detect even the most subtle of fabrications, and zap those as well. So this is why we're here. To get rid of our ignorance as to why there are fabrications going on, why our intentions are constantly shaping things. We want to see if we can end that spot where we stop fabrication not by stomping it out or holding it in suspension, but ending the point where there's no intention. The mind gets cornered. It knows that no matter which direction it goes it's going to head toward fabrication. It's going to reap the results of fabrication, which are stressful. It sees an opening and it goes for it. That's how the strange practice of just focusing on your breath can lead you to the end of sewering. You reach the point where you can con RM for yourself that what the Buddha taught about there being a deathless element is really true. And that, the Buddha said, is even better than soul dominion over the entire earth. So check and see if that's true, too. In keeping with the Buddha's teachings, we underscore the profound significance of disseminating wisdom extensively. Today, We've converted this voluminous thousand-page tome into an easily accessible audio format. Now, the responsibility to further this noble cause rests with you. Through your subscriptions, likes, and content shares, you play a pivotal role in the widespread distribution of these teachings, benefiting countless others. Let's uphold the age-old tradition of sharing knowledge and fostering mindfulness for the greater good of humanity. We invite you to join us in this mission. And together, we can create a profound impact on the lives of many.